much of the North American continent under the influence of cold polar air this Monday afternoon. Fortunately, not too much in the way of warnings, but we are looking at high winds in Southern California, winter weather in Montana, and lake effect snows out around Buffalo, Erie, and Watertown. Looking at the surface analysis, we'll work our way from east to west and go from oldest to newest. There's our weather system off of New England, bringing wraparound into the higher elevations of New England, and still liquid precipitation from Boston to Portland and over to Albany. Cold advection moving through New York and Washington, and as we go further to the west, we pick up snow. And there's a second shortwave back in this area here, and you can see the increase in winds going from Kentucky and Tennessee into Missouri, where we've got blustery west-northwest flow, and the thickness field showing a cold pocket right there, 519 decameters for that 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness. Down in Florida, the cold front is finally pushing on through. It's going to be a cold evening in the southeast. Cold advection all the way through the southern U.S. into Texas. Temperatures this afternoon in the 40s and 50s in that area. The cold front has pushed all the way into Mexico, getting one little storm down there in the Bay of Campeche, and also the gap winds starting up right through this area. You can see those sustained winds, 20 knots, and on the other side, down to the south, that's where we've got the downslope warming and temperatures up to the 90s. We return up north, and we've got two major high-pressure areas, one across the Great Plains. That's going to be part of that Canadian air mass, which has moved southward. And in the western U.S., we've got a plateau high. This is sustained by nighttime radiational cooling and snow cover. And that's the result of some of that polar air working across the continental divide and basically getting stuck right in this area here. And that's a source of cold air. You can see the 20s and 30s, the fog due to that strong radiational cooling in the valleys, and a northerly component as we get that cold air drainage and that pressure gradient pushing the air down to the south. On the west coast, dry conditions and Santa Ana flow. That's it right there, northwesterly winds in Southern California. Let's take a closer look at that. There we go. Some of the stronger winds are actually in the lower Colorado River Valley area, gusting up to 35 knots at Needles and 30 knots at Blythe. And further out to the west, high winds, 35 knots there at Ontario. Some of our sharper viewers may have noticed the dew points. Look how low those are. We're seeing down to minus 8 up there in the mountains and in the valleys, 3 to 12 degrees. LAX reporting 17 degrees, and that's going to be a huge temperature dew point spread. So relative humidities appear to be down below 10%. Yeah, we need to double check that just to make sure. Yeah, 7% at Ontario. Heading up north, we get into that plateau high. And up in Canada, there's the long-awaited cold snap. Now the temperatures back behind it are not that cold. We're talking teens and 20s, but it's the sheer volume of that cold air. You can see the effect it has in the thickness field, large thermal trough. So that air is quite deep, and it is being pushed by a 1060 millibar high. We don't see that very often, but the temperatures within that high are about 10 degrees. And typically when we get a 1060 millibar high up there, we're talking temperatures of minus 20 to minus 30. So this is definitely an early season event. The air masses could be a lot worse in terms of severity. So this is just kind of an early taste of winter. And looking there on the Pacific coast, I pulled a different item out of the toolbox. I've got an upper air front. I couldn't really find a boundary, a good boundary for a surface front. The air mass in here looked kind of cool but, you know, not that cold. And the temperatures in British Columbia, not that cold either. But aloft, considerable amount of cold air spreading over the mountainous area. So I think aloft somewhere in here, we've probably 
got a front up at 850 or 700 millibars. Then up there in Alaska, they're on the other side of that strong polar high, getting that southerly flow, but most of that is overrunning the surface layer. You can see the temperatures in this area here are about minus 8, minus 3, minus 15. It's really variable. So that's an Arctic air mass. And just above the surface, we've got that southerly flow spreading over the top of that. So I went ahead and did another upper air front right there. You can see the temperature contrast is really not that great on either side. Aloft is where the changes are taking place. At the surface, not that much contrast. Then over in eastern Canada, there's the bulk of the cold air, the thermal axis indicated by the thickness field extending south. The temperatures in this area, definitely on the cold side. I see a lot of temperatures below zero. And of course, that will be advecting southward into the prairies with that northerly flow setting up in the wake of that next shortwave. And then out in Quebec, cold, stagnant weather, cloudy, some snow showers here and there. And that circles back to the Great Lakes where we've got northerly flow and lake effect snows. So when we think about stacks, well, there's smoke stacks, there's bodybuilding stacks, and there's my favorite, pancakes. But in meteorology, when we talk about stacks, we talk about the vertical stacking of fields. And let's start into a little bit of this. First, we're going to look at the surface plots. Now, we do know that that cold air is barreling out of Canada. As we mentioned, it's not particularly cold, but it is bringing some high winds and some wind shield values. Let's take a look at the surface plot and find out where that front is. Now, we can go from what we would assume to be the warm air down here in Montana and follow it to the north and look for air mass changes. So we see here the winds are out of the west, temperatures about 30 to 31. And then right around here, Cardston, Medicine Hat, we pick up a northwest flow with temperatures about the same, but they start to drop off as you get up towards Calgary. And then up near Edmonton, they fall off to 25 and then into the teens. So we can assume that the leading edge of that cold air is somewhere in here, probably just about up to Cut Bank. And then we check on things a little bit further east in Saskatchewan and do the same thing. We track it along that line right there. We see temperatures about 27 to 28, and we pick up strong northwest winds right about there. Now there's a little bit of that further out ahead, so it does get a little bit tricky, and we know that this is closer to the occlusion area, so the air mass contrasts are not that strong. So just at first glance, I might go something like that. And with that, we would expect a decrease in the thickness field as you go north and not so much down to the south. So adding on that thickness field, there's the 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness. Zoom out just a little bit. And you can see the contrast is really not all that great. We can add on a few more lines, and still it's not really all that clear. I see a little bit of an increase in the thickness gradient right through here. The problem is that we are sampling the atmosphere through three kilometers of depth, and this air is probably not up to that full depth in the column. So it helps to look at a shallower thickness layer. Ah, there we go. Now things are looking a little bit different. There's the 1,000 through 850 millibar thickness. One problem is 850 millibars is up at 5,000 feet, and you're going to intersect the mountains. So that's going to be a problem. But in the lower elevations, that'll give us a little bit of a clue to where things are changing. So if we run that forward, there's this evening. I can see a gradient coming south. I think the leading edge may be all the way down here. So that's going to be our frontal position this evening. And then later tonight, it looks a little bit more like that. You can see those strong north winds coming back in behind that boundary. At 700 millibars, 10,000 feet, we see the same thing. The high a little bit further to the west. Low pressure to the northeast as usual. So we've got our pressure gradient. And we'll take out some of those lines so it looks a little bit better. And we see the leading edge 
of that frontal boundary right through here. So it doesn't look like it stacks that much back into the cold air. It's fairly vertical. And that coincides with that 850 millibar front. So let's take a look at 500 millibars and see what we've got going on. And there we go, 500 millibars. Kind of a similar picture. It looks like the stronger gradient right through here. So this is a vertically stacked front and definitely some cold air aloft over northern Alberta. You'll notice in that area of transition, a little bit of a cyclonic turning of the winds. And there you go, there's the wind plots. You can see the stronger winds out there in this area here. And we can add on the vorticity and that will reveal a shortwave. Kind of channeled there, but that is definitely a shortwave and it's driving that front. It's a reflection of that mid-level disturbance working through the flow. So a few wrinkles in the analysis, and let's think a little bit about what's going on. So we've got that cold air flowing out of Canada. Now assume that we had some slope to the front. We'll say a frontal surface kind of like that. There's the cold air, and we've got the warmer air overlying that. So what that would mean is your surface front would be located right in here, your 850 millibar front here at 700 millibars here, and then further back the 500 millibar front. And that gives you slope up and towards the cold air. Now, if you think about the thermal characteristics, we've got warm over cold, and that gives us a frontal inversion. So that tends to be kind of stable. And the only instability is down in this layer where you have strong surface conduction of warm ground that makes things unstable through a shallow layer so you build up some cumulus and stratocumulus up to that frontal inversion and sometimes there can be instability up in the warm air above the front on a day like today though things are a little bit different kind of a vertical structure to that front maybe even bulging out ahead at 850 and so the surface front located right here 850 a little bit ahead 700 just about on top of all that, and 500 maybe a little bit further back. Well, you notice that there's an area out here where you've got cold air overlying warm air. So cold over warm is going to be unstable, so you're going to get convection right through this area here, and that gives you some deeper cumulus elements, and it also overturns the layer and helps keep the front moving along as you bring some of that cold air down to the surface. And then of course the rest of the front continues advecting in the upper levels. Probably got your stronger winds up here and a lot of frictional effects working on the bottom of that layer. Those types of fronts do occur a lot in the northern plains. So you always want to be visualizing things in three dimensions as you go along and forming that vertical structure in your head gives you an idea what kind of processes are taking place in the column. And as you can see, I've got the GFS panel pulled up here. This is mid-afternoon. We know the front's coming through like that. Out ahead of the front, the soundings look like this. Looks like conditionally unstable. You can see some upper level moisture up above 12,000 feet or so. And then going up north, up towards Edmonton. And we find northwesterly flow aloft. I think all of this is actually cold air. And this inversion right here, it resembles a frontal inversion, but you notice that the dew point line does not follow it up into the right. It looks a little bit more like a substance inversion. But I think what's happening here is that there's strong modification of the air mass from the bottom up. There's very strong cold air advection in the lowest five to 10,000 feet. And so that kind of shapes the temperature profile kind of like that. That's all a cold column, I think. And you can see the photograph there, straight line out of the northwest. So that's the Arctic Express coming southeast. So we'll look very quickly at the rest of that and watch that cold air spill south already to Cheyenne, approaching Denver by tomorrow morning, and coming into the Sioux City area. So that's going to be the leading edge. And it looks like some of it is spilling out over the Continental Divide 
into the cascades. So that's a rather, that kind of signifies the deepness of that cold air. And look at that 1056 millibar high. Don't see that too often in the U.S. It happens sometimes, but it is a little bit rare. So let's see, by Friday morning, it's looking like this. That cold air is pushed all the way into the Great Basin area, banked up against the Sacramento Mountains, against the Guadalupe Mountains, and arcs back up through Dallas, kind of like that. So this is the old outgoing polar air, and this is the new stuff. A little bit of snow breaking out in the Texas Panhandle with that upslope working onto the high plains. Then going into Friday, that cold air just barges into the rest of the southwestern U.S., into Texas, and that 540 line, similar to today. And further up north, even more cold air coming into the Great Lakes and those lake effect snows getting started. And we see another coastal low trying to come together out there over the Gulf and doesn't quite do it. So it looks like a very cold period coming up here for the next four or five days. And that'll probably be a good place to stop for today. And in closing, I want to thank our Patreon supporters. Special thanks to Brian Nelson for the increased pledge. Tom Chidwick writes in the comments that he loves the polar analysis. He says you're the only forecaster who gives us that look, and it's extremely informative. And Ron Chalfant is out there in the mountains of Los Angeles. He says that today we have strong, gusty northeast winds. The Santa Ana's winds 20 to 40 miles an hour with gusts along some of the ridges and into the local canyons. He also asks to go into detail on the EPO PNA, and I will go ahead and do that soon. I need to get some graphics ready, but we'll definitely get that worked in soon. Anyway, I hope you all have a great Wednesday evening, and we'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.